Welcome to the Women and Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to Women in Wealth with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Esther, good morning. Good morning, Eric. How's it going for you today? It is fantastic. I, I'm excited. I love it when you have guests, but I got to be honest, I'm a little selfish. Today you don't have a guest, so it's just you and I. We're That's right. <laughs> I haven't right. done this for a while. Yeah, I haven't done this for a while. You've had some amazing guests on, so if you're listening, yeah. tuning in for the very first time, this is going to be a great podcast, but Esther brings on some amazing guests, so go back and listen to some of the previous podcasts. You'll hear some amazing stories and some amazing guests that she's had on. But today, we're talking about something completely different. Esther, what are we talking about? We are. You know, we're almost halfway through 2021. It's gone incredibly fast. Yes. It's just amazing. But I want to share what our clients are asking us in meetings about the economy and the markets right now, because I think it's it's top of mind for a lot of people and because clients are asking similar questions. And one of those questions to start off with is, you know, we're kind of back to normal, but it doesn't quite mm-hmm. feel normal yet. Yeah. And unemployment is still high. We're not out of the woods with this pandemic, but mm-hmm. you know, the stock market keeps hitting these new highs over and over. I don't get it. Yeah. Are we in this crazy bubble that's about to burst? What's going on? And we look first back to last year. And I'm gonna start with last year briefly. And always remember our economy is seventy percent, just about, based on consumers, what you and me are spending on services and goods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And last year, Eric, how much did you, did you notice that your spending shifted last year with the lockdown? Uh, Yeah, I didn't spend nearly as much. Yes. And that's so true for many clients as well, was we talked with them through last year that many were saying, yeah, obviously there's not the travel, Mm -hmm. there's not the commute, (laughs) our wardrobes changed. Eating out less. (laughs) Eating out a lot less, not going to concerts, not going to movies, not Mm -hmm. going to shows, Mm -hmm. all of that. And there was just, on top of that, early on in the pandemic, when we did go into lockdown, because the market is always anticipating what's happening six months out. So between February 19, remember we, we went into lockdown at about March 17th or 18th here. Mm-hmm. And starting in February, and it basically started to reverse in, at the end of March, but the market dropped about 35% during that time because yeah. stock prices are based on what analysts assume is a good price based on future earnings of a company. Mm-hmm. And if you think we're a consumer-based economy and your story is very similar to most of, you know, to mine and to others, we spent less money last year. Well, what happened is we weren't buying stuff. And if consumers aren't buying stuff, then companies aren't making as much money. Mm -hmm. And so it really impacted a number of industries. And one of the things I like about talking about stock market and economy is to me, it's very fundamentally based is how we approach it. It makes sense. The industries most affected last year, the energy sector, Mm -hmm. airlines. We just take those two. People weren't commuting. There wasn't as much shipping of goods around the world. There wasn't as much travel. So of course, we're not using or consuming as much energy. And we started the year with supply as if it was going to be a normal year. And so prices dropped a lot and energy was really impacted. Airlines, of course, nobody was traveling. Retail real estate, think about shopping malls Mm -hmm. 
and venues and things like that. People weren't attending. Hotels, resorts, cruise lines. Who, gosh, I don't know if, I mean, we had a, we had a cruise ship parked out in San Francisco Bay for a long time before they let those people disembark and get back to normal life because of the virus. It just sounded miserable to me. Yeah. And banking. Banking was really impacted because what if, you know, banks make money by loaning money and what if those debts turn bad, like in the 08, 09 crisis? Mm -hmm. That was the most recent crisis. And so that could have happened again. So there's a lot of concern about that. And then, of course, office real estate where, you know, people weren't going to work. They were working from home. If they were fortunate enough to have a job that allowed them to do that, they were working at home and thus office real estate prices really dropped. Mm -hmm. And in this type of environment, what did we see? What happens in a crisis? The government responds. There was huge stimulus in 2020. And this was primarily in the form of the CARES Act, which allowed for stimulus checks to be mailed out to consumers so that people could have comfort in spending. Mm -hmm. There was the payroll protection plan that um, was available to employers that said, if you keep your employees on the books, we'll provide you support because employees on the books, you're paying pay. And what is that pay being used for to spend? And also boosters to unemployment for those who worked in different service industries or who's, you know, that wasn't just service industries. I had clients at at C-level jobs, you know, chief executive, whatever jobs that were laid off because they worked in nonprofits or other areas where the pandemic really affected them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Unemployment boosters were given to increase the purchasing power of their benefit. And the Federal Reserve responded by keeping interest rates low. And when interest rates are low, all, what is that, you know, it helps. There was a huge refinancing boom that, that does continue Mm -hmm. even now for those who hadn't yet refinanced. The rates are a little higher than they were last year, but rates dropped to very low levels on mortgages, which are all keyed off the 10 year U S treasury. And that rate dropped below 1%. So that helped people refinance when people refinanced, they were taking the money out for improvements. Yeah. And often, and construction was high. You know, Home Depot did well last year. All these people at home looking around going, oh, God, yeah. I don't like this floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. The honeydew lists were long. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We've got to fix this. So that showed in uh, the industries that did well, which I'll talk about in a moment. And the... Markets really rebounded by the end of the year based on these pandemic-related stocks, you know, ones that really were benefits of the number of people staying at home. Names that you will know, Amazon, Mm -hmm. all of that shopping, all, you know, not going to grocery stores, not going to retail stores, going on Amazon to get, you know, the sweatpants or whatever was needed to make it more comfortable to be at home. Apple, Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, Mm -hmm. Microsoft, you know, all the the platforms so that people could work from home, teach from, you know, remote locations, so many workers going remote. Mm -hmm. Even Peloton did well as, you know, we bought exercise equipment because gyms were closed and, you know, cable satellite TV, you know, I think Netflix also that all of all of these companies did phenomenally well last year and really helped propel the S&P 500 up again after it recovered at the end of March and it was really led by a lot of these technology companies and by the end of the year those small cap stocks emerging markets those had recovered nicely as well because of a vaccine becoming available and the ability again for the market to look ahead to say this looks like we're we'll be moving out of this in 2021 so by the end of the year a number of different indices had double digit returns Mm -hmm. which as we went through february last year you know one couldn't have expected plus all the uncertainty in the market but the question is still there you know well why Okay, I kind of get that the market looks ahead, 
but we're still not out of the woods. What's why again is the is the market as high as it is, and we continue. You know, vaccinate vaccinations are more widely available and have been taken. More stimulus payments have been paid out by the government in 2021. And with that, there's more comfort to get out to restaurants, travel. There's a mobility index that's available that just shows how, you know, we dropped to quite a low during the the 2020 and how it's really come up with people traveling more, starting with like spring break of this year, how many more people are out and about. And I recently talked to somebody, so many people are going to Hawaii. I don't, do you know anyone who's planning a trip to Hawaii, Eric? No, not, not Hawaii, but we're, we're doing Mexico. So, okay. There you go. A beach. Of so some you're kind. We, Mexico or Jamaica or something. We, we have got to get to a beach. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like this, it's somewhere close that people feel comfortable to go to, mm-hmm. are very familiar with. And I spoke with someone who had just come back from Maui a couple of weeks ago. And I said, well, how was it? And they said, it's crowded. And there's oh, wow. actually more people flying to Hawaii now than there was before the pandemic. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, we're, tri- you know, my husband and I are planning a trip to Hawaii. It was already on the books last year, but we're planning one. And it seems like with almost every client conversation, there's a trip to Hawaii planned. So yeah. with that... The top performing sector this year is the energy sector, and that's Mm. both fossil fuel and alternative energies because there's mandates to remove gasoline-powered vehicles by 2035. Mm. And there's been a lot of investment at both the government and private levels in alternative fuels, but also fossil fuels, you know, as things get moving again, people are out and about, there is more global trade picking up again. It's the use of more energy. And we've seen, as I foreshadow an upcoming question, the inflation really hitting in the energy sector, as we've all seen prices go up quite a bit yeah. as compared to the end of last year. Mm-hmm. Airlines are doing a lot better. Retail, real estate, banks, what they found is there was not as much loan loss as anticipated at all. So banks have rebounded quite nicely moving into 2021. It's seen that what banks need to do is really improve their digital offering as much as I know I have clients who are like, oh, I don't want to get anything else online. But given all of the stay at home workers and Mm -hmm. there are a number of people who will continue to work from home, that this won't change that, that banks are really seen as needing to shift and move to a, a better digital platform. And then industrials that that create the goods that we purchase that those have moved up and rebounded quite nicely in 2021. The other issue that why stocks are higher, if you think about when, what are your options for investing on a very simplistic basis, there, there are, I was going to say there's real estate, but that's done on the stock market through real estate investment trusts, whether that's invested in apartments, in commercial properties, in retail, in office. Uh, So I'm separating out one's home here. So if you're investing, you're looking at stocks, bonds, basically, uh, and cash as your three basic alternatives. Mm -hmm. Well, the Federal Reserve has indicated they're going to keep interest rates really low to continue to make sure that there's enough support for the economy, make sure that people can continue to purchase cars at low rates, that they can refinance their home, that companies can continue to expand using debt at low rates. And we have seen a rebound in the 10-year bond up to about 1.6% yield from below one, as I said earlier. Even at that, investing your money in 10-year treasuries and leaving it there and generating a yield of basically one and a half percent for 10 years is just not that attractive. Yeah. And there are companies that are available that pay higher dividends. That's also, that's the form of cash payment from a stock is dividend versus interest from a bond. And they are very competitive and higher than the one and a half percent on the 10 year bond and also provide growth. Hmm. So it's another reason why the market is, providing very healthy 
returns through this. It's not seen as speculative. It is higher priced. There are very, the growth stocks, especially the ones that I mentioned earlier, they, you know, they ran up hugely last year. And so they are more expensively priced than a number of stocks in other industries that I mentioned that didn't do well. Mm -hmm. So there is still opportunity in the stock market, but it's important always to look at your holdings and see if they're well diversified because they can do great in one year and perhaps not so well moving forward or not provide the dividend income that might be helpful. So it's always good not to just say, okay, the stock market is up, so I'm fine, but to really take the lid off and look at what's, what one is holding and see if it makes sense given where, you know, we also, the stock market looks ahead six months or more. We have to look ahead personally as well. What is happening in our lives so that we're prepared in the next, you know, five to 10 years as our life continues and shifts and changes, are we prepared with our portfolio as well? Yeah. And I, I know that you mentioned inflation earlier, and I know we're going to talk about that here uh, in a few minutes, I'm sure. But when you talked about the 10 year bond, you know, mm -hmm. 1.6%, 1, 1. that doesn't even keep up with what I think inflation is currently or what it is possibly going to be. I mean, that's that, right. That, that doesn't make much sense to me. No. And the, the place where they'd be in a portfolio, I mean, that the target that the Federal Reserve targets for an inflation level, they assume inflation will be there, is 2%. Mm. So just mm -hmm. looking at that, obviously 1.6 is not 2. The place where bonds can serve a place is just for stability in a portfolio. And so that during the times of volatility in the market, one can say, okay, my stocks may be negative, but at least I'm getting that 1%, 1.6%. And I know what I'm you know, that that face value is there. Yeah. But it's, it's, we're looking a lot at portfolios. We are not relying on really treasury bonds to provide our bond allocation in our portfolios because of exactly that. They don't grow. The yield often is taxable and doesn't keep up with inflation. So it requires a lot of review of portfolio to say, what's the right mix here? How do we get the right diversification of yield as well as growth? Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, speaking of inflation, it doesn't look good to me. I mean, and, and it's very specifically, there are specific areas where, I mean, you spoke to it earlier, inflation is definitely affecting certain areas more than others. And from my own personal experience, lumber being one of them. Um, oh, yeah, right. Absolutely. Right? We're, I'm going through, and, and I know that your husband is a general contractor. I'm sure you yeah. hear about it quite a bit, yeah. but I've got, uh, I'm redoing a master bathroom, which I always pick the best timing to do these things, apparently. <laughs> but the guy that I'm working with, he's a longtime friend. He's like, can you, can you believe? He goes, don't throw any two by fours out, you know, because we have some scrap yeah. stuff that we're using. And and uh, but the, the two by four in my area, I looked at it yesterday. One two by four is eight dollars and fifty cents. And I remember mm -hmm. having to buy a bunch probably about three or four years ago when I redid an area of my home. And I remember them being about three bucks, three and a half dollars each. Yeah. It's a huge jump. And I, I yes. saw, I think, a report yesterday in the last year, lumber has jumped up 260 percent since from one year ago. And I just thought that's because all those people stuck in their homes, just like you said earlier, <laughs> looking around right. going, boy, this place is a wreck. I need to fix this, that, and the other. And uh, yeah. And then of course, production went down because of COVID and, yes. and production went down across the board for a lot of industries. So what mm -hmm. are you, what are you seeing and what questions are you getting asked about inflation in general? Well, the question is basically the concerns about things like that, that when there is government stimulus and there's a lot of money being printed basically to make available that historically has caused higher inflation. And inflation is, you know, what what is inflation? We're talking about the rise in prices of goods and services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, lumber is a great example. I, I hear these stories, like you said, from my husband just about every day. Lumber, plywood, which is part of lumber, switches, appliances, mm. all of those things. And, and it is somewhat connected to the fact that the supply chain just really dried up last year and it's taking a while to get it back online. But why is inflation such a problem? It's if prices are higher for lumber for your two by four, a, a consumer may step back and go, you know what, I'm going to wait on this project yeah. or I'm going to shrink the scope of this project or I'm not going to go out and 
you know, do the summer driving trip because gas is up. And all of those things, if we go back to the original discussion, the consumer is 70% of the economy. So the concern can be if consumers cannot afford as many goods and services, then the stock price, which is based on earnings, if earnings decline because consumers aren't buying as much, then the stock price, then the company revenue goes down and then that affects the stock price. Additionally, it is purchasing, manufacturing inflation. So companies have to deal with this as well. If prices go up for, for them to produce their goods and services, then mm-hmm. they would pass on that increase to the consumer. And again, that, that starts that cycle. And often in inflationary periods, what happens is that the Fed moves to increase interest rates to help stave off inflation. That creates higher rates for loans and it cuts into profitability and consumers' budget, but it's a way to try and reduce prices continuing to go up and up and up. And just recently, this week, it was reported that U.S. inflation hit 2.6% in March, and that exceeds the Fed target rate of 2%. What happened? Mark, world markets, world markets sold off on this Hmm. news Hmm. out of the fear that we are going to see this scenario. But what happened within three days, you know, what, when, where it hit most were those technology companies, those higher priced stocks. And when I first came into this industry, I worked with a gentleman and he would teach, uh, his name's Bob Swift. He's uh, retired now, but he's out of um, Southern Arizona where I was living. And he had uh, come into the industry through being a stock broker. And he said, you know, it's just, you can take these headlines and you can back up a story for anything you want people to do. Yeah, You you can call people up and say, oh my gosh, higher inflation, we'd better get out of X, Y, Z. And uh, that creates a commission for the seller, but it creates Mm -hmm. the fear for, you know, the, the, the person who holds those shares. Oh my gosh, I've got to run to safety. And we see this in the smart, I mean, it really impacted markets had their worst time since October, but it's rebounding now because yes, prices are up this year. Uh, Absolutely. As compared to last year. And then, especially at the pump, there was the ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline. And that is a company that supplies gasoline across the country. So you can see spikes in inflation coming out of periods of crisis. You absolutely can because, you know, it's a shift. It's a change. Bringing it back through the stages of transition, you know, we're in what's called the passage stage where it's making adjustments, readjusting to what's new, what is happening now, what will happen. We don't know for sure where we'll be a year from now, and but we're just getting online from last year. And what's happened is that if these are comparisons to last year, yeah, there's going to be inflation. There's going to be higher prices as people do start buying again, but there's headwinds to sustained inflation. Mm. And you and I grew up around the seventies, Eric. And do you remember inflation? I mean, I remember growing up with inflation and I had no idea what it meant. I was like in third grade and it was the gas pump crisis, you know, the lines mm-hmm. of the gas pump. And and in retrospect, as I've learned, you know, there was double digit inflation. And imagine if our household budgets were going up by 12% a year just yeah, because of prices, not because of stuff we were buying. That would be devastating. That's Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it would be really hard to to be able to plan much, except how am I going to pay for these extra prices? Because incomes weren't going up by 12%. Mm -hmm. But now in the 2020s, you know, we have global manufacturing, global supply from, which is reiterative, but from all around the world, commodities are being shipped and We can get into a, a, we won't, but we could get into a political conversation Mm -hmm. about the, you know, human rights of all of that and everything, but that's not the focus today. But there are cheap commodities from all over that weren't in the 70s. And it's a really different type of environment, which does typically make it hard for companies to raise their prices. Although, you know, we can argue with, I mean, I know communications companies seem to raise their prices a lot, but it's hard for just the basic goods and services you know, if we go to Target or whatever, because they've got so much competition, 
mm-hmm. from Amazon and other retailers that it's it's very challenging. And I will even say from the standpoint of a financial planner who's done planning for clients for you know well over 25 years at this point, that pr- we've been using two and a half to three percent for inflation for for goods and services and, and that's held for the most part. And, and then we put in different plugins for vehicles and things like that. Mm-hmm. Vehicles can be more expensive, but they've got a lot more technology in them, a lot more safety, a lot more features. So what I've seen is not that unless people are having challenges controlling their spending, that really outflow has not increased greatly over the past decades. And that is expected to continue. That is going to be stable moving forward as we mm-hmm. get through the trend right now. Yeah. The other question, you know, when when people ask, but it's like unemployment is still high. We still get head, headlines on mm-hmm. unemployment. And the numbers came out last week uh, that unemployment didn't decrease. It has been decreasing by millions of jobs being added. But with the latest number for April, it increased by a tenth of a percent. Hmm. And But, you know, what would you expect markets to do on that news? Yeah, I would, I would, I would expect them to go down a bit, but I think they're still going up. But they did not. They, well, they actually, didn't. they did. They they performed, you know, just fine on that day on that Friday. Came yeah. were up again, and why? Because it's not a situation. There's a couple things. One is if unemployment dropped and dropped and dropped, there'd be a, another concern. Inflation is one. What will cause the Federal Reserve to raise rates? Again, mm-hmm. if Federal Reserve raises rates, then our ten-year Treasury. This is exaggerated, but let's say it goes from one point six to four. It, it won't jump that high, but just as an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. Well, now, hmm, those bonds are looking a little more attractive yeah. than the stocks that go up and down and up and down. So money may move to bonds. So maybe stocks are overly priced. So there's always a concern that if there's more and more people in the workplace, then we don't need to give as much of an easing for the economy because there's money to spend. Mm-hmm. So given that unemployment is still stubbornly higher above 6%, then the market said, phew, we're not going to be raising rates anytime soon. And why is it so? Though Then you get into why is it still above 6% or just at around 6%. It's not a situation now like it was last year where workers were losing jobs because there wasn't the demand Mm -hmm. for the services primarily. Could be the goods as well. Now... There are, I don't know how it is in your area. I have clients in Maine. I don't see it so much here, but in other parts of the country, it's been reported there's tons and tons of help wanted signs out. Mm -hmm. There are more jobs in the service area specifically than there are workers. And why aren't workers available? There's concerns. Workers are nervous to come back in. They may have to care for, care for their children because mm-hmm. schools aren't broadly reopened exactly. yet. So who's yep. going to be there if their third grader is online schooling? Yep. They may have to care for their parents because the adult daycare or other adult services aren't yet back available either. Mm-hmm. And unemployment benefits still have the added benefit. And in some areas, in some states, there, you know, there's a statement saying, well, and I, I've, I've actually heard this even in my own town in Northern California, my, one of my favorite restaurants that I go to, she said, I can't get help workers because they all say, no, I'll lose my unemployment and I'll make more on unemployment. Mm-hmm. So, and, and then we had the, uh, with the car manufacturing stopping because there wasn't enough supply of chips. So that also added to people taking unemployment recently. Yeah. So it's a situation where it's not a lack of jobs as much of it is as a lack of workers who are unwilling yet or unable yet to come back. Yeah. And that's something in our area, you drive around and you drive past a car dealership, there are 10, 12 cars on the lot. It, it, there's a there's a huge shortage of mm-hmm. even the cars for sale. Mm-hmm. And and I, I've been hearing of dealerships calling some of my friends saying, hey, look, we, we know that you purchased this car a few years back. We'd like to buy it back from you at a mm-hmm. pretty good premium because they, they just want to get cars on their lot to sell because they don't mm-hmm. have the inventory. It's crazy. Mm. So interesting. And, they you know, that used cars was one of the areas that went up last year mm-hmm. in terms of doing very well. Mm-hmm. And that's um, why there aren't any out there now. <laughs> and there aren't any out there now. And yeah. it's another reason why if someone is planning a trip out there to Hawaii or wherever in the U.S., I can't speak to Mexico, but many of the 
rental car companies had to sell off their vehicles mm. at a premium because people were not renting them and they needed to keep revenues coming in. So they they sold their fleet. Yeah. And now they got premium um, dollar for it too. Premium, yeah, premium dollar. And now though, when we go to rent a vehicle in Maui, they were saying that people were renting U hauls to get around. And <laughs> our trip to we're going to the big island and we're paying one hundred dollars a day for a small vehicle. You know oh, the tiny, yeah. you know the the smallest. The compact, That's not that yeah. unusual for Hawaii though. But there, you know, again, my my associate advisor Eric Shea, they're planning a trip to Maine also, and they're paying two hundred fifty dollars a day. Oh, for a vehicle that will accommodate two car seats at because that point, of that black. Nah, see, at, at that point, I would get a U-Haul truck and just put the car seats in the back <laughs> <laughs> with a bunch of bubble wrap, right? Just a bunch of bubble wrap to keep the kids safe. And, no, I, well, please don't you know, take the that next advice, pod- <laughs> The next podcast is going to be, I'm interviewing your kids. I don't know if you're aware of this, but <laughs> they're going to be my guests. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, well, they're 25 and 21, so good luck with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> they have a lot of memories to share, that's, though. That's right. Oh, yeah. Please don't ask them those questions. <laughs> Esther, I know we're running low on time today. This has been fantastic. What else do we need to hear today on this podcast? Well, I think overall, the consumer, you and me, just when you think consumer, whoever's listening, that's you that I'm talking to and me. For the most part, consumers feel healthy because they did save, and and I'm talking fiscally healthy, they Mm -hmm. saved money last year because they didn't spend as much. Savings are up across the country. House values are up. It's one of the Mm -hmm. reasons that you know, lumber, et cetera, is high price. There's a lot of building going on. There's need for housing. So house values are up. Portfolio values are up. If one is fortunate to have a portfolio that they're all up. So the consumer feels very healthy and stable. And we have headwinds that we're looking out for. I mean, China is doing very well. They had a different approach to the pandemic, you know, different societal approach of basically locking everyone down and they've achieved herd immunity and their economy is going gangbusters. And there is a concern about, what does that mean in terms of our economy and ability to compete? There's COVID variants that are a risk to going into shutdown again. Growth stocks are really high priced and we continue to see low interest on bonds. So what are the the choices out there for people? Mm. And if you'd like to hear more, we're hosting a webinar on June 17th and with one of the investment managers that we use on behalf of our clients. It's City National Rockdale, and we always have a really good engaging conversation about what is happening with the market, the economic indicators, what are the headwinds, and what are the tailwinds. So if you'd like to know more about that, please use the Contact Us button on our website, and we'd be happy to get you signed up for that. Yeah, and I think we can also put that that link in the show notes as well for this podcast oh, specifically. So let's do that and make sure that people can click on that. As we close, Esther, I, I, I know that a lot of things within the economy are a domino effect. And I would love for you to verify this with your with your lovely husband because of the industry he's in. But I do blame the mm-hmm. lumber, the price increase on all lumber. I blame that on toilet paper hoarders because at the start <laughs> of that pandemic, you and I talked about all those toilet paper hoarders and then the I manufacturing – that True. had to go into creating more toilet paper. They took all the trees. So my two by fours cost more because you people ho- that hoarded toilet paper. That's I know. Maybe it's it's too bad you can't like reverse engineer the toilet paper back to the lumber. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't trust that two by four. <laughs> That's just me. That's just me. All right, Esther, this has been a fantastic podcast. Such great information. So much information. You gave the contact information as far as people wanting to attend the webinar. How about contact information for you? Because people probably want to have conversations about these things just straight with you. Yeah, I'm happy to talk with you. We set up information appointments, complimentary for 20, 30 minutes or so. And you can also do that through the contact me button on gatespassadvisors.com. Let us know and happy to talk with you. Fantastic. Esther, again, thank you so much for your time today. This was fantastic. Thank you, Eric. Always good to talk with you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. You bet. And I'm going to echo what Esther just said. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Women in Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And this is one to share. Please share it quickly because of that webinar. They'll be they'll have such a great opportunity to hear a wonderful conversation and learn more. This one is packed full of information, as you just heard. So please share this so they can learn that as well. And it'll be great to have that discussion. And I'd love to see debates happening across the dinner table about toilet paper hoarding, 
two by four prices and, and all the other things we talked about today. Again, thanks for listening <laughs> today. For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security.